The idea was that I was going to have this like massive, I was going to fill a room up with drawings. So this was the beginning of it. And it was all going to be like patchwork together. I thought it was a really good idea. <laughs> Yeah, so the idea was that it was going to be patchwork on lots of different types of material and then yeah you could change the order of the images and you could have it like around the corner or you could have it go up onto the roof and you could have the images even go on the floor and you could walk on them and draw on them and it could yeah it wouldn't be finished so like a patchwork of sort of dream images and the non-linear that like narrative Pajamas. <laughs> My brother got me these posh colouring and pencils, so I had to dutifully draw something with them. <laughs> you know, people buy you art equipment that you don't really want, you don't really want, and then you've got to like appear grateful. <laughs> I won't put that in there just in case your brother's watching. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a nice sort of sensuality to it, but there's also this like nature taking over the over the body in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's like a romantic, positive thing, as opposed to a frightening, terrifying thing. It kind of softens it up and makes it more digestible. I actually put that one on t-shirts. Sold quite well, which I was really weirded out by, because I thought, well, no one's going to want to wear her, she's a, bit, she's a bit too weird. It's quite a unique environment as well to create that, that collection of things. Yeah, again, it's like parallel things that aren't there in Congress to each other. So the sounds of farming equipment is, it is a different environment to the sounds of the boatyard equipment, which is more industrial, like you are saying, and then you've got all the nature sounds. But also nature sounds that don't necessarily go together either. So you've got the sound of the seabirds with the sound of the woodland birds with the sound of the... So it's like a mash-up and a mix-up that gets... Yeah, it kind of, you know, sort of gets into your, like, like, into your body. Mm -hmm. This is the bit of kit that I needed for fucking years and I never bought it. What's the bit of kit? Oh. Oh, really? There's a seaweed on the wall over there. Is that seaweed? Is that seaweed? Yeah, it's seaweed. Do you want to go over there? No, no, I think I got a nice shot from it. There's a pre-Raphaelite painting, I should know what it's called, Circe, I think, and she, she's in this pose where she's like, she's quite childlike, um, but she, she turns men into boars by looking at them, so she's kind of this sorceress type woman, and she's a powerful and dangerous queen, but yeah, she's like welcoming you in and inviting you in, and then dangerous I suppose. And then you know you were saying about my pain thing, that's why I thought I'd cut her hands and her head off. Like, when it's really bad I think of it as being bigger than my actual hand, like it's bigger, it goes... I can't encompass all the pain, it sort of spreads out past the skin. And then there's this idea of just cut it off. And also the pain, so the pain is somewhere else in your body, so it's in your feet or your hands. But the place that it's like localised in that you're experiencing in is in your head. And then kind of all the sort of mental processes that you go through. So, you know, the idea of trying to sever it, think about something else, push it away from you, get it away from you, but, yeah. And then again, I suppose the meditative process as well is the idea that you, if you can breathe with it and live with the pain and experience it, then that actually releases it more than if you fight it and do this thing of just like, like, putting your guard up, I guess. Came 
out to me. I can't really remember how it started. I think I wasn't picking them fast enough, or he, I was complaining that there weren't enough potatoes in the rows. So I wasn't. It was piecework. So I was getting paid by how much I picked. And like I was arguing, and he was saying, "Oh, on the other side of the valley, you'll be able to pick X amount per hour, and then you'll be earning loads of money." And then I went to the other side of the valley, and the same problem was there. There was all blight in the rows, and that. Yeah, I completely lost my shit. And I kicked a bucket, and he turned around and he swore at me. And then I picked up a potato, like I mean, it was like a massive, like the size of a baby's head. And I slung it with all my might, and it hit him in the ribs. And he's like this really thin little sort of wizened guy. And I don't know who was more shocked, me or him, because he was like, it really hurt him. And I, I couldn't believe I'd done it. But yeah, that, I think that was pretty much the end of the, our working relationship. Was <laughs> when I smacked him with a potato. Growing up in a farm, uh, what kind of animals were you used to on a farm? What kind of animals did you use? Well, uh, mainly handling sheep. Um, that was, that was a, like, there had been a dairy herd, but that was kind of when I was too young to remember it. So the whole time I worked on the farm, um, yeah, it was mainly, mainly handling sheep. We had, like, quite a different selection. By the end, we just had Dorsets, but initially we had, like, quite a wide range of different breeds. But, uh... Yeah, we had the ducks and the, the chickens. I mean, quite a few years ago we, we did do turkeys for Christmas. It was quite um, a big part of the year. I remember saying that like, turkeys are a good way to spoil Christmas because it's a lot of death <laughs> and a lot of work and a lot of cold and filth and, um, yeah, and all hands on deck, you know, lots of work. And then the Christmas day would come and just the, all you were really celebrating was that the turkeys were gone. <laughs> like, 